Gayla Christine Shaper was a 28-year-old from Moscow, Idaho. She was married, and the couple together owned a dairy farm. On June 29, 1979, Gayla's husband dropped her off at a pasture so she could feed their horses. The plan was to then meet up later at home. Gayla never arrived. She was never seen again. I'm at Denzel, and this is Unfound. Due to the pride, vanity, and ego we all have from birth, we are all so sure about so much. The Patriots were surely going to win the Super Bowl during their undefeated season. Oh wait, Dewey was certainly going to defeat Truman. Then the election actually took place. Leisure suits of the disco era were going to be fashionable forever. Then the clock ticked over to 1980. We just never know what's going to happen. Hey, what fun would life be without some surprises? And yes, I know sometimes those surprises are bad news too. That's life. But many times, the reason we get surprised is because we don't know all the information. For example, the aforementioned Patriots. What people forget is the two teams played the last game of the regular season that same year. And the Giants were ahead at the beginning of the fourth quarter. The Patriots ended up winning by only three points. So maybe the Giants beating them wasn't that big of a surprise. What I'm saying is sometimes surprises are truly surprises. Other times, they are really just us being unknowledgeable about a common occurrence. Well, in the disappearance of Gayla Shaper, everyone at the time thought her husband was the one and only suspect in the case. And this continued for over a decade. Then a new piece of information surprised everyone. And now in 2020, maybe we should think that this disappearance is not what it seems. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Good's website, charlieproject.org. Gayla Shaper was born in Moscow, Idaho, went to school in Moscow, Idaho, and worked her business in Moscow, Idaho. She got married to Ken, and they had a dairy farm. Gayla loved the outdoors, but most of all, her horses which she kept on another person's land. She fed them daily, always making sure they got attention and love. But in the months leading up to Gayla's disappearance, some weird incidents happened. Heavy breathing phone calls in the middle of the night, and the receiving of a message with the letters cut out from the newspaper and magazines. What did it say? You have sold out to Satan. Situations like the disappearance itself that are still unsolved in 2020. So, June 29th, 1979, as happened regularly, Ken dropped Kayla off at the horse pasture, which was near the intersection of Lenville Road and Route 8, just outside Moscow. The plan was for Kayla to meet up with Ken and other family later that day, either at home or at her mother's house. When Gayla didn't show up that evening, the family drove around looking for her. They couldn't find Gayla, and no one reported seeing Gayla after Ken dropped her off. She was never seen again. Police suspected Ken was the instigator of Gayla's disappearance, but they couldn't prove anything. 
Ken, in turn, has professed his innocence from day one. And that continues into the 21st century. Like some recent episodes of Unfound, this one seems to be a situation where we have good reason to believe the husband isn't telling a truthful story. Moreover, in any disappearance, nothing is worse than having to take one person's word. Would almost rather have nobody's word. Yet, maybe this husband is telling the truth. So I ask you to consider these questions. Number one, how probable is it that a woman could be abducted in daylight near a busy highway? Number two, what are the odds that a person connected to the horse pasture property would be convicted of murder in 1993? And number three, regarding that murder, could it actually have something to do with Gayla's disappearance? Gayla's family has not spoken publicly about her disappearance for many years, so their thoughts are not known. The guest for this episode is Anthony from crimeblogger1983.blogspot.com. This is his fourth appearance on Unfound. Unfound News. Did you catch me on Dr. Telesco's show on November 19th? If you missed it, you can go either to her YouTube channel or Unfound's. We had a great discussion about the disappearance of Robin Abrams, a case we covered four years ago when Unfound was just a pup. And I'll say it again, I could talk to Grace all day about anything. Next, I know that I mention the live show every episode, but if you've never listened to it but have considered it, I would suggest finding the most recent one from November 18th. It was one for the ages, and it covers a lot of my thinking on how we handle our business at Unfound. In addition, I once again commented on the disappearance of Jennifer Kessie. Finally, I want to mention that my sister Diane had a birthday yesterday, November 19th. Happy birthday, sis. She turned 39. again where you can find unfound unfound supports accounts on podomatic itunes stitcher instagram twitter spotify deezer facebook and youtube speaking of youtube on wednesday nights at 9 p.m eastern please join us on our podcast channel for the unfound live show all of you can talk with me and i can answer your questions Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. You can also contribute at PayPal, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. And do not forget the website, the unfound podcast.com. I'm so happy to again for the fourth time have Anthony from the crime blogger 1983.blogspot.com website on the program. Anthony, welcome back to Unfound. Hey, thanks for having me on again. I appreciate it. Uh, you're very welcome, Anthony. You, good, you do good work, and we like to recognize good work on Unfound. This is your fourth time, and I think we uh, kind of get together at least once a year. It was a little, I think, over a little over a year ago when you were last on the program when we discuss the disappearance of Lucera Sarabia in Texas. So it's good to have you back on. Thank you for making the time. I appreciate that. I really do. I really enjoy coming on this program. You're welcome. Thanks. Let's talk a little bit about yourself. I know that uh, you like to keep your identity um, somewhat of a mystery, and we will do that for the purposes of this interview. But let's just talk about you as your interest in st true crime, how it got started, when you started your blog, and we'll start there, and then we'll move on from that. Okay, we can do that. Um, I started my blog in uh, September of 2016, if I remember correctly, but I've been interested in true crime for quite a while, honestly. The disappearances really got me going, um, starting with Tammy Leopard, and I kind of just had it taken off since then. When I branched out, two other missing persons cases and so on. Mm-hmm. 
And so I, I know that I, I know that I'm quite a bit older than you are, but do you? I know you were a big unsolved mysteries guy back in the day. I don't know if you're watching it, the new version, but back in the day, big unsolved mysteries guy, right? Yeah, I've watched the new one. It, it's, it's not bad, um, but yeah, I was big on unsolved mysteries when I was younger, and that got me. Um, but I just like mysteries in general, but the, the true crime aspect was really fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting, Anthony, that both of us are in true crime because I think you know this. You, you probably know the demographics of your audience at the blog, but you know, 80% of the people who are into true crime are women. You, you know, you and I are in the in the minority. <laughs> um, yeah, I know the demographics. Even on my Instagram, it's like 85% women and the rest are men. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it, it's a little unusual. What would you say was the um, – going back, so you started your, your blog in September 2016, which coincidentally is when Unfound started. What was kind of – I don't want to call it the, maybe the final straw, but the final motivation for you uh, to start your blog after being a, you know, a follower of true crime? What was the thing in your – the light bulb that went off and said, you know what, I think I'd like to cover this, write about this? What was it? Well, a lot of the time when you're um, like watching a program or reading a blog entry or newspapers or something, they usually mention, you know, the person of interest uh, name or there's a person of interest in play in a certain case that's done on, and they would never go any farther into that. They'll say, like, you know, law enforcement, you could question them or they refuse to do this or they haven't been able to get evidence on them or whatnot. So a lot of the time... Um, I felt that if somebody else could bring pressure to the people, um, it might help a little bit, you know, um, at least from a journalistic perspective of calling them out or, or otherwise just harassing them, really trying to get some answers that way, kind of, kind of go a little farther than what law enforcement normally can't do. Uh, I thought about doing that, and it kind of blossomed from there. Mm-hmm. Okay. And regarding the process that you go through, uh, regarding covering whatever kind, types of uh, cases you fo- you write about on your blog. Once again, crimeblogger1983.blogspot.com. How many different cases would you say that you are working on that are going to be on the website? How many of those uh, are you working on at one time? Oh, that, that varies. Right now, I'm probably, um, I'm always in between cases. I never work just one at a time. I work a majority, even the ones that I cover, I, I still work those. Um, so it, it's a lot. I mean, right now, the ones that are going up, I can count off the top of my head probably seven um, that I'm wow. working right now that aren't featured on my blog. And then, I, like I said, I still work the other cases when I can. Mm-hmm. They're already done. Wow, okay. And how often would you say that you publish a, a new entry, like uh, just start. You, I'm sure you update some of the cases you already covered, but how often do you post a new entry to your blog? Would you say? I I try to do it once a month, but there are stretches to where I'm still logged down in work that I can take a few months off. So you'll see on my blog that it'll be like um, a case a month, and then I might be absent for two or three months, and then the next month I might publish four entries in one month. It just really depends. Okay, just depends. But you have a, you're, I guess what you're saying though is you have a, a lot of balls in the air at one time, juggling multiple cases at one time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's the way we do it too. Although I would not say that we're working on seven, but maybe three uh, are always like, yeah, I guess what you'd say in the pipeline that are going to be coming out every Friday. So I can certainly. Uh, relate to that, but certainly not seven. So you have a lot of things going on there. It must be tough to uh, manage all the different facts. Uh, do you have a pretty good system set up, keeping things separate? Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm a little different, though. I handwrite all my notes, so I've got folders all over my shelf full of handwritten notes. I don't do – got to retain the knowledge, so I write it down. I don't type it out or save it. I'll save some of them in files, you know, on a computer for digital purposes, but – I mainly write all mine out, but oh you're under a little tighter window than me. You you have a schedule you got to keep, so it's a little harder for you. I don't. I just do it when I can. I, I that's right. I do have a schedule to keep. You're certainly right about that. But uh, so yeah, so it, sometimes it can be a little difficult. But you handwrite your notes. That is old school. 
Wow. Oh, well. Oh, yeah, I got calluses all over my fingers. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so, like, uh, pen and paper, writing stuff down. Mostly pencil so I can erase stuff, but yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I'm a big computer guy. I, I don't think I could ever do that. And I have horrible handwriting, Anthony, so I could never do it like you do. But I, I, you have certainly have, seem to have the patience to do that, so I applaud that. Wow. Uh, let's move on to this. What is your, your process? Now, of course, today we're going to be talking about the disappearance of Gayla Shaper, who disappeared back in June of 1979. But and we're not going to get quite into the specifics yet. But what is your process using maybe galas as an example of your process of how you start getting into a case, assembling information, and then that you know that day when you decide, you know what, I, I think I'm ready to present this to the public. How does that process work for you? Um, her case is a little different. I've done a couple cases like this to where I'll be so bogged down. It's kind of weird. I'll be so bogged down in cases, or I'll be stuck on a case, or I'm not getting anywhere one that I want to feature on the blog that I'm writing up that I need to get away from it for a while, and then I'll go just pick another case. So it's kind of like a side case, mm -hmm. which is kind of funny with all those other ones that are still pending. But I'll pick a brand new one because sometimes it'll open my head up and it's different ideas. So um, hers was basically I peruse, I think it was uh, Megan's case, uh, website, The Charlie Project, and I was going through cases. And I usually like to find obscure ones that mm -hmm. um, aren't featured or written about a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And then I'll kind of just go from there. And if I can get more information and branch out, if there's enough articles or if there's some people that I can contact uh, that were involved in the case or if I have some kind of um, law enforcement friends in that area, something like that, I'll, I'll try to go down the rabbit hole and it starts from there. And then um, I want to do... A lengthy entry, at least one that is different. Um, I don't like, I don't like um, entries where a lot of people have done the same work. Or if, the, if those entries are out there and they've done it and I've covered it, it just means that I don't think they covered it well enough or they missed something. I just like being able to provide a new perspective to a case or or feature one that hasn't been featured. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned uh, reaching out to family members. I know the first time you were on the program uh, was for Tammy Leppert's disappearance, something uh, a case you've already mentioned. But you, in, for example, in that case, uh, reached out to her sisters, I guess it was, and got to speak yeah. to them about Tammy and what was going on in her life uh, back in the 1980s when, when she disappeared. Um, would you say that finding family members for these other Disappearance is not just the ones you've appeared on Unfound for, but ones that have just been on your blog. Easy to find family members, hard to find family members. Uh, it's relatively easy to find them. It's just getting them to want to talk to you is the big thing. Um, it, it really depends on how you – you have to have a different approach depending upon the person. Uh, sometimes it takes a whole lot of time, and you've got to spend a whole lot of time just to get them to open up to you, which is understandable because yeah. a lot of the people that do our work are more interested in making a name for themselves and helping, so. Right, right, okay. All right, so that's part of your process. And how much information, I, I'm guessing it varies from case to case, but just maybe a, a general idea. I mean, how much information do you think you have to have before, you know, you're ready to write a blog that once again becomes public for everyone to read? I know, for example, in my situation, I'll give you my example. For example, what determines when we're ready to record an interview is, for me, when I think I know the material enough, well enough, that I can ask good questions to that guest. That's my standard. What is your standard? Uh, my standard is, yeah, it does kind of vary. Um, the details of the case, if there's enough details in the case um, that I can write about, I guess, like, you know, I usually want somebody, um, I, I usually like cases that I can go after somebody with. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tend to harass people that I know. If I'm going after you, I know that you're guilty or I, I think that you may know. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times it, um, it doesn't go well in terms of, I don't really try to, I'll try to talk to suspects and if they don't want to talk, that's fine. But if 
a lot of the time they try to scare me and that doesn't work very well. But I want I want at least an outline of like uh, the circumstances of the disappearance and any persons of interest in the case and um, any kind of new details. I like the little details. Those are the most important to me. So it usually starts with that. I just need a, mm-hmm. um, a good outline of the case, basically. Right. And the listener, by the end of the at least know let the reader know what direction this case would probably go in. All right. And yes, if you go to uh, Anthony's blog, uh, the listeners will find that um, Anthony uh, is very passionate, and he does um, contact, uh, try to contact some suspects. And you've, I mean, we won't get into any of those specifics here uh, officially, but you've told me about some of those conversations uh, off the air. And, you know, some of the things that have gone on over the last, uh, I guess, uh, about three years of us knowing each other. So, yes, and you're very passionate about that and and trying to contact these people and giving these suspects a hard time. I, I think you're known for that. Um, and you also, it doesn't seem to me that the age of a disappearance scares you at all. Of course, you covered, you were on the program the second time to cover Evelyn, Evelyn Hartley's case from the 19. 19- 50s. Maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, going back that far and trying to collect information in contrast to, of course, Tammy Leopards from the 1980s, Lucera Sarabias, which are a, a lot newer. Um, what can you say a little bit about that, collecting older information? I, I kind of like the older cases uh, a little bit more because they're not covered very much um, in terms of the cases, but it doesn't say that I just specifically – stick to those ones. I, I tend to like those ones a little more because you can always add a fresh perspective to them because a lot of the cases now are, are new kids, are newer cases with children and stuff, which they should be covered too. But if a family member reaches out to me to, regarding a case and it's a new case, I'm not going to tell them no. Right. Um, but I, I do cover cases from all generations. But the, the older ones are, are fascinating to me because I like the the way law enforcement looked at it from the uh, the time period, um, and I think applying a new perspective or today's perspective on older cases uh, can really help try to help solve them or at least provide a new insight into what a case may, what may have happened to that person or something like that. But uh, yeah, I cover um, any kinds of cases really, but Mm -hmm. the older ones are more fascinating to me. Okay. And maybe you can tell the listeners... um maybe a couple uh, different websites. I'm, I'm guessing that you are subscribed uh, to a couple different websites or databases out there. Um, can you tell the listeners maybe some of the most popular um, databases or websites you use? You've already, already mentioned the Charlie Project, which, of course, everybody at Unfound knows, but maybe some of those ones where you have to pay a subscription that you think are the best ones that are maybe worth the money. Uh, Ancestry, newspapers.com, newspapers archives, my heritage, things like that. Um, even um, some of the uh, third-party information sites like Ben Verified. Mm-hmm. Uh, I usually use those to, or White Pages. White Pages I use a lot for family members tracking yeah. them down. Yep, um, that's a good ben one. Verified is one I use a lot for suspect to to um, see what. The, if they have any criminal records, what their addresses may be, phone numbers, so on. Sometimes I'm a little too forward uh, than I should be, I guess. I've contacted family members and they've been completely just surprised. And they're like, you know, I can obtain information a number of different ways. Mm-hmm. But I've surprised a few of them when I've contacted them by text message on their phone. And they're like, you know, nobody knows my phone number. I'm like, well, you know, that's not true, but I got it. But, yeah. Yeah, so sometimes, you know, a little too forward sometimes, and you got to apologize, but I'm I'm kind of a aggressive person. Yes, you are. I, I, I agree with that. It's a good aggressive, though. Yes, and you're right. It's not easy, especially if you're covering older cases, to just call somebody out of the blue, a disappearance that's 40 years old, and saying, yeah, I'm a blogger or a podcaster, and I'd like to talk to you about your family member's disappearance. A lot of people are going to be like, what? And I've had that happen. I know my assistant Emily has had that happen, too. But that does happen, right? <laughs> yeah, the last time I did that, they were real paranoid about it. They asked me who I worked for. They thought that I was like 
in with the suspects or something. I don't know. It was really strange, but it, it, like I said, that's when you got to talk them down and, and try yeah. to give them some information and, and let them know that you're not trying to right. screw them over or whatnot. That's right. Totally true. You know, I, I'm not sure, you know, some of these things we're talking about here, I, I'm not sure these are things that the public, maybe it occurs to them when you, you do a podcast or write a blog, but these are some of the things that we run into. Even though we're trying to be helpful, sometimes the people we encounter are very defensive, at least to start. Yeah, and a lot of the times, if you're, the, the word gets out too, because they'll tell their friends or their family members, and sometimes it gets back to the people involved or probably involved, and then they want to contact you, and yeah. that's when they find out, I don't scare too easy. So, yeah. or I don't scare at all, but, yeah. so it, it's interesting. Right, right, and I, I've, maybe you've had this happen too, that, um, you call somebody and you'll leave a message and then they'll call you back and they'll admit that, you know, I didn't answer the phone call because I didn't know your number and then I listened to your message and I had to look you up and everything before I called you back. I mean, I've had that happen before. Oh, yeah. People are suspicious, but I'm glad. Hey, we have nothing to hide, right, Anthony? We're doing good work. No, I don't I, actually at all. So, yeah, it just um, it's a little harder for me too because I keep my identity private because a number of different reasons, but the main reason is is that I want to harass as many people as I can to help get cases solved. So, and plus, it's easier when you're, you know, coming out of nowhere. And they don't know you're at you're at a personal advantage when you're going after a suspect and you know who he is and you they don't know who you are. So That's true. Once that you then um, with them, like they'll try to threaten you or something like that. I'm like, you don't even know who I am, but I know all about you. And that's always usually all I have to say, and then they start to let it sink in, and they think about it, and they don't try to scare me anymore. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for uh, kind of giving uh, the listeners a little behind-the-scenes look at you know how you what you're thinking, uh, your process, uh, how you go about collecting information, and some of the resources that you use, and uh, your mindset when you are contacting people for the f first time. Thank you for that, Anthony. Once again. Uh, the website is crimeblogger1983.blogspot.com. All right, so let's move um, to the disappearance that we're going to talk about exclusively for today, and that is Gayla Shaper, who disappeared from Moscow, Idaho, on June 29, 1979. Uh, what attracted you to Gayla's disappearance? Uh, the lack of coverage, lack of um, the details regarding her disappearance online. Um, and, and, and one aspect was that, um, it reminded me of a case that I'm working with right now, uh, it's a murder case, actually, it's Dorothy Jane Scott, it, it's similar to that, and, uh, that's what caught my eye. Hmm. And so this was just, as you stated, I think, before, just going through Charlie Project or where, wherever, and this particular case, once you read the general details of it, uh, you said, this is something that I think I can cover and write about and find more information on. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. it went kind of like that. Mm -hmm. has to be tough. I mean, from my position, um, you know, with us, of course, we don't cover a case if we don't have a guest. So we're kind of limited by who wants to talk. We're, for you and other bloggers, I guess, you know, you kind of maybe have a wider range of choices. So it can't be easy to kind of narrow down what you're going to work on when, when unfortunately, there are so many missing persons cases out there. It can't be easy to narrow it all down. Um, yeah, there's some cases I wish that, that I could cover, but, um, like, Megan does a good job of, as you know this, Megan does a good job of trying to keep her information up to date and the details. So a lot of the time, she'll have a case on there that I'd like to cover, but um, if there's no details on it. And in her entry, it'll say like a few details are available for the case, and I'll try to search some down or submit a records request that'll be pending because of the COVID stuff. So um, I can't get a whole lot of information on it either, and I don't want to basically just copy what she wrote down already. So I'll, I'll leave it alone for a little bit until I get more information on it. But yeah, it um, it's hard sometimes. Uh, if you have a family member. Or you can reach, if I don't have any information like that, and I can reach out to a family member and they can provide me more, I can do that too. But it, it's, it's, it's interesting sometimes. Right. Okay. All right, let's talk a little bit about Gayla. Uh, you've learned, I think, quite a bit about her 
since uh, getting interested in her disappearance. This is a disappearance that's 41 years old now. So what can you tell the listeners uh, about family, uh, married, uh, have any kids, uh, work, things like that? Uh, let's start there. Okay. Um, Gayla was born. Her name was uh, Gayla Christine Schaefer. Her maiden name was Nelson. She was born on May 1st, 1951 to a couple named Laverne and Connie Nelson. Um, she was an only child. And she was a graduate of Moscow High School in Idaho in 1970. Mm -hmm. um, she ended up marrying Ken Shaper. Um, I'm not sure exactly how long they were married before she disappeared. I couldn't find a marriage record for them okay. at, at the moment anyway. But they don't have any. They didn't have any kids together, and they joined or co-owned uh, Dutch Boy Dairy in Moscow, Idaho, and that was their main source of income. So, uh, so they have a dairy farm. Uh, so, am I then to understand maybe they had cows and had a had a farm? Is it... I'm not sure about that. Um, you know, I don't know if they were um, if they were a different kind of uh, I forget the type of um, like is it wheat or they may have been a, a, a milk or dairy that had no cows at all. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought about that at first. I don't know if they actually had any kind of uh, cows or horses. I know that she kept her horses on a pasture that was owned by somebody else that was a neighbor. Right. But I thought there may be, um, you know, a non-animal um, dairy. But uh, when I found one of their old ads, that had uh, their logo was two cows in a pasture. So I figured that that probably wasn't the case. But okay. I'm not sure exactly what they owned in terms of animals or farm or whatnot. Okay. So what you're saying is uh, she grew up right there. She disappeared from Moscow, or Moscow, Idaho, and um, she grew up there. She graduated from high school there, and that's where she uh, disappeared from. She got married. She and her husband have this uh, business uh, in the milk business. Now, you've already mentioned uh, the horses. Uh, that's going to play a, a huge role later. But just for now, maybe explain. She has these horses, but they're not on our land. Uh, please explain that a little bit more, if you could. Yeah, she owned two horses at the time, um, and they were they lived on a pasture uh, near their uh, house. But the, the actual pasture that those horses lived on was owned by a neighbor of theirs, the Hagedorns. Okay. And how close was this? Was this uh, field, uh, this pasture, close to their house? Could this be something that? She could have walked to? Is that close? Yeah, it was been walking distance, yeah. There's, there's been redistricting or whatever they call it, where it used to be, in the, at the time in 1979, it was considered a rural road, but since then it is not. So all the newspapers and give a different address. It's since then, okay. um, the address has changed, so it's kind of hard to get an actual idea. I know they said it's near Linville Road to Pasture, but mm -hmm. I haven't been able to narrow it down. Okay, so she has these horses, two of them, but she's keeping them on somebody else's uh, land, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing some listeners are going to be like, well, if they have a, a dairy farm, they should have plenty of land for two horses, but maybe not. I, you know, I'm not a farmer, so I can't get into that, but that was the situation at the time, and she would go over to feed them. I'm guessing uh, she was into riding horses or whatever else. Now... Let's uh, talk about this, and this could be something that could be connected to her disappearance. But she and her husband uh, were getting these calls and hang-ups. Let's talk about that. Okay. Um, yeah, months, the months prior to her disappearance, they were receiving late-night calls and hang-ups. Um, the actual, what was said in the calls has never been hinted to. Uh, or actually ever been recorded, so we don't know exactly what they were. But after Gayla disappeared, um, her husband, um, if you read some of the articles, the husband said that he felt that somebody was out to get them, and he didn't know who it was. Mm. But they uh, received the phone calls. And uh, one thing here on this case is a little different. Um, yeah. I wanted normally to contact a family member of Gayla's, but when I read how much the her husband had been through over the years. Yeah. Um he's been remarried and so on. 
he, he seems like he's been tortured by this. And I really just got the, I didn't want to contact him and ask him any more questions because I didn't want to bring it back up. It seemed like a very bad mm-hmm. thing in his life and he doesn't like to relive it. So mm-hmm. I didn't want to do that to him. So there's a lot of the questions that seem like they're easy, like what time was, what's the exact time of, that she went missing or when did he drop her off and so on that mm-hmm. I don't have because it's not been reported. But that's the reason why I just didn't want to bother him. Okay. I, I can totally respect that. We run into that same situation on Unfound. On fact, this uh, we're doing this interview on November 12th, uh, 2020, and the episode that's coming out tomorrow was a situation where the family still can't talk about a disappearance, and so they requested that uh, some friends of the family do the interview instead. So very common. I totally get it. So they were getting these calls. And the way you have looked into the information, were they bothered by it? Did they get the impression that these were just kids, you know, prank calls? Or was it something a little more serious than that? What can you glean from the information you looked at? I'm thinking they probably took it a little seriously, but they weren't in like a total panic mode about it. I think that they may have thought that somebody was just trying to harass them or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, just pull, you know, try to, you know, mess with their heads probably, but I don't think he, that Ken took it too seriously until Gayla disappeared, of course. Yeah. Okay. So they're getting these calls, um, as you and I have talked about, it may, you know, off the air, uh, if, when we decided this was going to be the disappearance that we covered, it could be related to the business or it could be related to, to Gayla herself or something else. We just don't know. Either or, really. It just, I don't know if they're connected to the case. It could have been. Mm-hmm. If that's the case, then it means that there was some um, – whoever abducted Gala was planning on doing it yeah. uh, for some time. But it could be that they're also totally unrelated. You know, somebody yeah. – you know, it, they could have used it to their advantage. Whoever abducted Gala could have known about the calls. They could have heard about them and said, hey, if I do something and could not feel it, they may think somebody else did it. Who knows? Right. And what you're also saying is over four years later, the calls, which are verified they happened, have never been connected to her disappearance at all. It's just a, um, it's no. just a theory. There were two separate type of calls, but yeah, the calls before she disappeared and there were some calls afterwards, which I'm sure we'll get into later. Yeah, and we're certainly going to get into that. But the ones before, no proof that they were connected to her disappearance at all. None whatsoever. Okay. Well, let's move on to this. There weren't just calls, but I, um, there was at least one message. Uh, the way I would explain it is it's all like, like almost out of a movie where a, a terrorist or a kidnapper or somebody you know goes to the newspaper, cuts these letters out, and makes a message. This happened to Gayla and her husband as well, didn't it? Yeah, on Good Friday, the same year that she disappeared in 1979, which turned out to be April 13th. They received a letter, and I wish I had more information on it, whether there was any postage on it or anything, but Mm -hmm. basically it was um, a message that that was wrote out out and cut out newspaper letters and magazine letters, Mm -hmm. and that's all that's been really released on it. When when you think about it that way, it it seems like um, my thought is that there's a number of dairy businesses at least another, at least one other one in town. I think there was a few in the area in Moscow and Moscow. Mm-hmm. Um, like you know, it could have been somebody worried about you know business. Could have been their business could have been uh, affected by the Shapers Dairy business. I'm not sure, but you know, it could have been something related to that. It sounds like it, but I don't know. So a little uh, competition. The competition trying to intimidate them. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, in either the the situation with the phone calls or this message, do we know what uh, was expli- explicitly said? With the phone call, the, the, with the letter, yeah, it says you've you've sold out to the devil, but that's it. I mean, not, nothing else has been released on it. You I sold out a uh, hmm. form. I'm sorry. I just saw a request for the files, but with COVID and everything, it's yeah. not going to be any time soon. So. Right, right. You sold out to the devil. Any uh, Anything that uh, you know about them that that would equate to anything? 
I know that they were uh, very active in their church. I don't know what their church was, but according huh. to reports, that both the Shapers are very active in their church. There is a Mormon, uh, that's the area of the country where there's a lot of Mormons, so uh, I'm not sure Okay. If they were Mormons or whatnot. Okay. All right, so maybe there could be some sort of uh, religious angle uh, to this. You sold out to the devil, I, I'm, I guess it just depends on trying to get into the mind of somebody who might not have had their own mind. So, All right, so they got this message, but it was, like you said, almost three months before she disappeared. Right. Okay. All right, so those are some things going on in there, lies these calls. And at least this one message that you know about that was sent to them, they got somehow, uh, you know, uh, somebody took the time to go through newspaper magazines, cut out the letters, and then paste or tape them all together into a message. Okay, let's move on to that day of June 29th, 1979. What do uh, we know, what do you know? Uh, about that day, uh, Gala's movements, her hus husband's movements, and everything that, that happened after that. Yeah, like I said, I don't have the exact time. They say sometime during the day. Um, Ken went to take his car into Moscow to get it washed at a car wash, and he had dropped his wife off at a pasture, the same pasture where she kept her horses, so that she could feed them. And he was to be back within the hour. He came back within 45 minutes, and he couldn't find her. Um, she was either going to go back to her house, which was in walking distance, or to her parents' house, which is at uh, which was nearby, which was also which eh, which was a was also within walking distance. Excuse me. Okay. Um, in the Woodlawn Hill, Woodland Hills area, and we were at neither place. So the family got together. They started searching the area. They couldn't find her. And the um, local sheriff's office was notified around midnight that same day. Mm -hmm. So we're just, uh, it, it sounds to me maybe we're just a little unclear. So he drops her off, and it, she was supposed to walk over to her family's place, and that's where they were supposed to meet. He wasn't supposed to pick her back up at the, the horse pasture, I guess. No, because the horse pasture is, is, from all accounts, right by their farm. So I think that he just picked her up, and she was already in the car going to get the car washed, I think, that he mm -hmm. just drop her off. It's near State Road 8, so mm -hmm. it's not very far. Um, and like I said, she was either supposed to be walking to her parents' house, which is in walking distance, or walking back home. Okay. And she was at neither destination. Okay, so Ken uh, finishes these things with his car, comes back. Uh, nowhere to be found at any any place, and they alert the police. Uh, what what is done next? Uh, searches. We have to remember this is kind of um, farm area. This isn't like forests and and everything. But what is done uh, at the time? Uh, the searches of the area in the county, and they and they didn't find anything. They questioned people in the area with no results. Um, they distributed her poster all throughout northern Idaho with no results either. Um, mm. They also reached out to uh, Dorothy Allison, who's now just the, the quote-unquote psychic. Um, from what I read, they weren't impressed with what she was giving them. Mm. They said everything that she gave them was immaterial and that Gail was still missing. So, um, But yeah, they wanted to basically conduct some polygraph testing, and they said truth serum and so on, but they did not get the permission to use it to actually for, for many years afterwards. So they were, weren't able to actually start polygraphing anybody or, or mm -hmm. doing anything else with the investigators. Weren't able to get authorization to do so, but they did provide searches of the area, and the flyers were distributed, but the case was cold very quickly. Okay. Now, I know a lot of the listeners are going to be thinking, well, that's a likely story. Guy drops wolf, wife off at horse pasture, she disappears, and people start wondering, did that actually even happen? We've had a couple disappearances recently on Unfound, Angela Green, Marion Hurley, where the husbands tell stories that are, are quite sketchy. Uh, I'm guessing the police did look at Ken. Um, six months after her disappearance, can uh, petition the court to receive Gayla's half of the dairy business. And I think that when he did that, he was trying to protect her interest 
from what I read and what I interpreted, I think there was a strain between him and Gail's family. I think it thought that he was involved in her disappearance. All right. Well, and that could make sense. The story yeah. is, you know, it, it does seem a, a little thin. Um, you know that. I know that. I think a, a lot of the listeners who uh, either read your blog or listen to Unfound uh, know that we get quite suspicious these types of situations where a husband, say, they just drop their wives off somewhere and she disappears and there's searches and nothing to be found. But could could they ever prove that, for example, Ken and um, Gala were having uh, a bad marriage, anything like that at all? Nothing, no. They were both uh, in a very stable relationship. There were no issues at home. And like I said, they were involved in their church and they had a, a newer, their dairy business was pretty new at the time. So mm -hmm. um, there were no issues marriage that they could ever find or anything like that. Okay. All right, but her family, obviously suspicious, uh, which I think makes sense. Uh, witnesses. Yeah. He says she dr he dropped her right off on this road by this horse pasture, kind of out there, not a hidden area. Any witnesses say that she, they saw her get in a car, saw her walking away, anything like that that you've been able to find? None, none whatsoever. All right. So this uh, further, I guess, adds the idea maybe this drop-off never happened. Okay. Um, let's move on to this. Now, at some point afterwards, and you can uh, say specifically, uh, there were calls made to Gayla's mother. Why don't you explain that? Yeah. Um, at some point... Um, after Gail's disappearance, I think about a couple months afterwards, her mother uh, received calls from uh, a woman that she thought was Gayla. Uh, there were two separate calls, and they both stated, the caller stated that they needed help, and, uh, huh. and that was it, they could be hung up. The mom, Connie, thought that it was her daughter. Um, law enforcement did not believe what it was. They thought, it, from what I understand, they thought it was probably a prank that does happen. There's cool people out there. Um, they did end up putting in a, a voice recorder for calls uh, on the phone line just in case these calls came through again, but none of them did. Um, there were no other calls after that. Interesting. So she thought that this call... Uh, these calls were from Gala, but they weren't recorded or anything. Um, do you get the feeling, once again, just your intuition, there might have been a thinking that Gala's mother might have been making this up? Um, possibly, but, you know, I, th there's a lot of missing persons cases where the person receives calls, yeah. the victim's family calls, sure. and they turn out to be from some jerk that, Playing a prank that they think is real funny and it's not. So That's true. I don't. I don't get the hint that she made it up. I think they were those calls did come through. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that um, they stopped after the after law enforcement put in the recording system, but mm -hmm. that could be a coincidence. Right, and certainly this would have been something that was uh, all the locals knew about. I'm sure they would have seen the flyers and everything. And you're right, somebody, some idiot could have uh, found, of course, back then in the phone book, found Gayla's mother's number and, and did these calls for a while. Certainly true. Right. Okay, but those calls never been connected to anybody. To this day, we don't know who made those calls. Correct. Okay. All right, so we have this situation that um, Ken's story, I'm going to guess some people at the, poli at the time uh, didn't believe it, but the police questioned him, could not find any flaws in his alibi and what happened that day. Of course, we can't forget, um, I'm sure Ken told them about these calls that they were getting beforehand. They pr he probably showed them the message, uh, et cetera. But still, uh, nothing could be done. Of course, it's 1979, no social media, no internet, no cell phones, nothing. So, and, uh, and certainly, I guess, nothing uh, at the scene where he allegedly dropped her off, any signs of a struggle, anything like that. So, 
the way I would put it is things kind of went cold. We move into the 1980s, and anything was there, was there any movement that you could find on her disappearance during the 1980s? None. It, like I said, it went cold all throughout that decade, basically. Um, there was an occasional article in the newspaper around the anniversary, but you know nothing really um, that was substantial. Mm -hmm. That um, nothing at all. It's cold. Okay, so uh, really cold. It's as if she just dropped off the map, um, beamed up to a UFO or, or something like that. Or once again, uh, not that we believe in that, but. Uh, Ken's story, I'm guessing people continued to be very suspicious of him during the 1980s. And that takes us to the 1990s. Uh, 1993, let's first talk about this. Ken took a polygraph. Yeah. Uh, I guess they started to, were able to get the actual um, clearance to be able to polygraph some people. Mm -hmm. They started polygraphing people in the inner circle, and they... Ken ended up passing the polygraph test, and I think they did some more investigation and began, and, and they eventually completely ruled him out as a suspect. Okay, so 14 years later, uh, are we then saying uh, back in 1979, uh, Anthony, that uh, Ken didn't offer to just take a polygraph to clear himself? Of course, we know polygraph tests uh, can be wrong many times. He didn't offer to take one, once again, from the information you've looked into. Never offered. He may have. He may have, but like I said, at the time, the, the investigators were were kind of um, signed me. They weren't able to use or get any kind of um, clearance to use any kind of additional tools in their investigative work into her mm -hmm. disappearance. So they yeah. weren't able to use any kind of a polygraph. But, I mean, he took it in 1993, so I don't see there'd be any reason why he wouldn't do it in 1979 either. Right. Okay. And uh, being that we're going to talk about, uh, you've mentioned the name already, but this is going to be uh, a main part of the rest of the discussion. Do you think that it was just a coincidence that Ken happened to take this polygraph in 1993 and in it, there was also kind of, I guess, a break in the case also in 1993? Are those two things connected or, or do you think that they are totally coincidental that they happened in the same year? I think that um, that happened for a reason. I think that um, it happened right around the time or, or right after um, the person on the pasture. His, mm. his name was Larry Hagedorn. Um, mm. His son, on October 26, 1993, uh, ended up, he stated that he accidentally shot and killed his living girlfriend at the time. Her name was Joanne Grace Romero. Um, in the side, he killed her with a 38 caliber gun. Um, after he was arrested for that, mm -hmm. um, the law enforcement stated that they got from an, they got a anonymous witness to state that she was murdered because she knew information related to Gayla Schaefer's disappearance. Wow. But the anonymous person, I believe, was um, Joanne's family, the Maya and Joanne's family, probably her mom. Okay. So you're saying that, uh, once again, going back to the people who owned this horse pasture were the Hagedorns. Um, uh, William is who, the son or the father? The father's name was Larry. He passed okay. away in 2005, and then William was convicted okay. of uh, 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 Joanne's murder. Mm -hmm. And he was going to, uh, I think it was like 30, 37 years in prison. He's he's scheduled to be released, or at least to be, re to be released in the next couple of years. So. Okay. So the owner, the, the owners, um, the son of the owner of this property mur ended up murdering his girlfriend 14 years later. And this is maybe what caused Ken to be polygraphed, maybe? Yeah, probably. Okay. But I think they wanted to eliminate him, the possibility of him being a suspect after all this. Okay. And um, they gave him a polygraph. But I, I will state that Larry, at the time, um, did take a polygraph test as well, and he passed his too, so. Wow. Okay. 
So because of this and because of this information that Joanne's family put out there saying that uh, their family member Joanne who was murdered um, had information that maybe some, maybe the Hagedorns caused Gayla's disappearance. This is what they said she might have been murdered for. I don't know if there's any proof of that. So obviously then this inter investigation gets reignited uh with all of this and they started looking into the Hagedorn. So what did what did police do? They immediately questioned um William, um the son that shot his living girlfriend about this information. Um there was some further information added. They were saying that um the anonymous source said that um Joanne was killed because she knew what Larry and William did to a girl and a metal shack that disappeared in 1979 in Moscow. Um, so when he was confronted and asked about this, William uh, started to almost cry. I guess he teared up and cried. He said he didn't want to get his father in any trouble, and he refused questioning at that point. Huh. Okay. Well, I, I'm sure then, though, that this was enough to get some uh, warrants to search the property. They did that, right? Yeah, um, he did do that. They looked into Larry's background. He, at the time, I don't know if you still did it in 93, but at the time, he owned a construction business and he owned tobacco. So they immediately searched his property um, and they started excavating. Um, he did own a metal shack that was near Linville Road. They searched that. They basically just mowed it down pretty much. They went kind of gung-ho on it, which is kind of cool because law enforcement are usually worried about, you know, um, the repercussions of their actions and with the defense attorneys and so on. But in this case, they didn't. They just went gung-ho in it. They found a – I guess Larry was a convicted felon. I don't know what his uh, previous offenses were, but he, he had did have an illegal firearm on the residence, and they arrested him for that. So they immediately threw him in jail. Um, they dug up the area – where that metal shack was in the immediate vicinity. Mm -hmm. And they did uncover some items, um, but they were unable to link it directly to Gala. But they did find a blouse and a, a pair of tennis shoes that were wrapped in a shower curtain. And those were consistent with Gala, what she was wearing that day. And they did uncover two bone fragments. They ended up sending those bone fragments to the FBI crime lab in Quantico, but nothing substantial came from those tests. Um, I'm assuming nothing substantial in terms of identifying them as mm -hmm. human or animal or any kind of thing that would be used prosecutorial mm -hmm. uh, came from them. So. Okay. And But we have to remember this is 1973 or 1993. So are you saying in the last, I, I guess it seems, that those fragments have not been tested yet? Uh, to determine whether they are galas or not? Uh, I'm a, I'm, that's probably true. Wow. Probably true because a lot of the time, um, especially since they were then, and they probably still are, they're a small sheriff's department. I don't mm -hmm. know how the funding goes in their state, but we all know that they only get a certain amount of funding per case, and they have to yeah. distribute that throughout the department. So I don't know whether if they have the funds to actually get those tested or whatnot. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Yeah. And we have to remember 1993, the way I think about it is that that was just on the cusp of DNA becoming a thing, uh, being able to test uh, the first test coming out, being able to link DNA to people. Uh, and I can understand maybe in 1993 or in 94, 95, maybe nothing could be done. But you would you would think uh, 27 years later that something would have been done uh, at some time, maybe. Yeah, a lot of the time in those cases, too, though, the, the evidence gets lost or misplaced and they can't find it, so I don't know whether if that's the case or not either. Okay. But well, I guess what we're saying overall is to this day, we don't know if those were humans' uh, bones or those were an animal's bones. We just don't know. Right. Okay. Same with the, the clothing found, although them being wrapped in a shower curtain is kind of, you know, kind of odd. But I, I agree with you. Uh do you know, in any of the information that you've been able to find, uh, was uh, this uh, these shoes and this shirt or blouse, uh, were they ever shown to Ken, uh, her husband, 
Because I, I would think that seeing his wife for the last time, he would remember what she was wearing. Did they show those things to him and he say, yep, that's what she was wearing? Do we even know? They said they were, they were consistent with what she was wearing, but I don't know if he um, – he probably did see him, but I, I don't know whether he could – I mean, they've probably they've been in the ground for a while at that point. But who knows what kind of condition they were in? Right. So um, I'm sure that he was showing them, but um, as to whether he could confirm it or not, I don't know. But they they do know what she was wearing at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, on all the reports, but like I said, it's not been conclusive one way or the other. Okay. And you couldn't find uh, any pictures of these shoes or this shirt that have ever been published in the newspaper or anywhere else. No, no, that's the unfortunate thing about it. The, the details are rounding, um, the whole disappearance, and, and just the, the whole thing has been very poorly reported. So, Okay. Well, I'm guessing that being that Ken was the number one suspect for 14 years, 1993 was a pivotal year. It sounds like a pivotal year in this investigation going uh, a totally different direction. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think he was cleared, and I think um, it was a relief to him because, yeah. you know, um, all that all those years he probably uh, heard it from some people or imagine what the poor guy had to deal with. Yeah, right. Assuming that he's innocent, which I think he is, but, um, you know, I guess there's always I, – I think he is because I don't think somebody would just make that story up about, you know, Joanne knowing that that's a whole lot yeah. of work, and I just don't. You know. Okay. So I think he's innocent, but he had to live with a, a long time with a lot of suspicion on him. It probably wore on him a lot. Right. And in, and in looking at all these articles and everything that you've done, you know, sometimes when we read articles, for example, all you as you know, a lot of old murder murder cases are getting solved from the 70s and 80s using DNA. And in many of these articles, it would read, well, this John Smith, he was a suspect at the time, but nothing could really connect him to the murder. But now with DNA, they've been absolutely 100% been able to connect him. Anything that you've ever read that either Larry or William or them together were ever considered suspects in 1979 but could not be connected to it in any way? Any articles ever say that? I'm sure they were questioned. They said they were questioned everybody in the area and so on. Um, so I'm sure they were questioned, but I don't believe that they were actually ever looked at uh, mm-hmm. as persons of interest. I think we kind of left that, all the uh, avenues and, and everybody looking at Ken at first until, up until, you know, um, William killed Joanne. So. Right. Okay. Do we know the circumstances under which Joanne was killed? Was this like a, a lover of squirrel? taken to its ultimate end or uh you know it was it uh, do we have any details on on the murder itself did she come home from work and he just shot her she walked in do we even know anything about that yeah it was a uh according to him it was a drunken argument that lasted up to four hours um wow. she wouldn't leave him alone and and let him go to sleep he said he pulled the gun out to scare her um and that she went to grab it, and I guess that it shot her on his uh, on the in the side, and um, that pretty much it. She was rushed to the hospital. They were able to keep her alive for a few hours, and then she ended up succumbing to her injuries. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. It was, um, there's a whole. He, he was crying about it apparently, and said he didn't mean to shoot her and kill her. And he, I think he was just saying that he was trying to get some sympathy, but it didn't work because they arrested him immediately. He said that he was he kissed her um, when he tried to give her mouth to mouth, and she kissed him, and he thought that she had forgiven him. He tried to sell that kind of BS. Um, it didn't work, though. The jury still convicted him. Okay. Uh, let's talk about it. So we have these Hagedorns who pop up out of nowhere after 14 years. However, Gayla's disappearance is still unsolved. It's been 27 years since uh, this murder in Moscow, Idaho, happened. Uh, with Joanne being murdered. Um, anything that came out at the time or since, did, did Gayla, in going over to this horse pasture as many times as she went over there, did she ever complain about William and Larry? Any, any, any interactions that she ever talked about? Her family ever said, oh, yeah, you know, after the fact, oh, yeah, she had big-time problems with them. Anything like that? 
I don't think so because she still had her horses on the same pasture with them and they owned it. So they may have, I mean, uh, if there was some issues, there weren't enough to, for Ken to be able to, you know, point in that direction mm-hmm. if it would have helped at all. I know that he, he was, um, after she disappeared, he, he was talking about how um, two uh, people had visited the farm. I guess they were, it was a business type of uh, meeting they had. Uh, in the months prior to his appearance, and he was saying that they were odd because they seemed like they wanted to talk to Gayla instead of him. Um, they seemed to be wanting to talk to her. But if you look at Gayla, she's a really attractive blonde. Um, yeah. She she um, she probably wore the you know a, a hat and, and she was wearing Levi's at the time, and she looked like she was a very uh, attractive uh, woman. So I don't know whether he may have just been reaching at that point. I mean. Um, Obviously, her being attractive, men are going to want to talk to her more than him, so mm-hmm. I don't know. Right. I mean, that's how I said it. But. Okay. All right. So, to to your knowledge, to our knowledge, uh, Gayla never complained about uh, William and Larry or anybody in the Hagedorn family when she would go over, over there you know, to see her horses. I think it makes a lot of sense what you say that if she was having a problem with them, you'd think that she would have moved her horses somewhere else. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, in addition, it, it doesn't seem the Hagedorns were ever mentioned as suspects back in 1979. And it also seems that uh, Ken being the number one suspect for all those years, or the, I just say, just say the only suspect, um, he never said anything, well, you know, don't look at me, look at the Hagedorns. You know, they used to harass Gaelish should tell me about it. He never said anything like that, at least to your knowledge. Right, exactly. Okay. In going back to 1993 and looking at those articles, did Ken ever make any public statements to a reporter about Larry and William and uh, this murder? Did he come out and say, yeah, I think that they're the ones? Has he ever said anything publicly about the Hagedorns that you've been able to find? Not publicly, no. Never. Okay. Now, since 1993, have there ever... Has there been any other uh, developments uh, in, in this uh, disappearance? Unfortunately, no. Um, like I said, Larry has since passed away. He passed away in 2005. Mm-hmm. Um, and William is still in prison. Um, mm-hmm. So, no, nothing uh, has been since that. Uh, since 1993, unfortunately. So I don't know um, what uh, direction, if any, has been taken on the case since then. Okay. And something that occurs to me is that it doesn't seem, I mean, 27 years, I don't know if that's, I mean, you, you and I think are very similar in our belief that when these things happen, these guys should never get out of jail, ever. But um, it it doesn't seem, you know, this is 27 years uh what I want to say is it doesn't seem like they offered him any type of deal. You know, well, if you know, if you were involved in Gala's disappearance and you give us some information about it that leads somewhere, you know, you get a, you know, a discount on your sentence. Nothing, it doesn't sound like anything like that happened. I think since it was a separate crime and there was no, um, you know, prosecuting, um, prosecutorial proceedings going forth with the, Gayla's supposed murder, but they really couldn't do that. Um, And from what I understand and from what I read, both Larry and William engaged in the activity of Gayla's disappearance. So Mm -hmm. I don't think he can implicate one without the other. And he seemed to be very protective of his dad. So he didn't want anything to come, anything happen to his dad or get his dad in trouble. So he was really, you know, defensive. uh, He was real defensive about, you know, implicating his dad in anything. So. Right. Okay. Um, be uh, the younger William Hagedorn. Uh, were, were, would he and Gail have been about the same age in 1979, like late 20s? Is, is, that, is that how the yeah, calculation probably, works out? Uh, yeah, around that because um, I did see a birthing announcement for Joanne and William in 1984. And they had just had their first child, so 
And uh, ironically, in that same article, his dad Larry had a new kid too. So they had a he had a kid. Larry had a kid and a grandkid born the same day in 1984. So, um, yeah, and uh, William was in his 20s, I believe, at the time. So they were close in the same age okay. as um, he was with um, Gayla. Okay. Now, we should maybe um, uh, clarify something regarding uh, Joanne, is that she and William were uh, boyfriend and girlfriend in 1993, but uh, – is there any proof that they were ever a couple in 1979? That seems like a long time to be boyfriend and girlfriend. Were they a couple in 1979 or not? I'm not sure, but like I said, 1984, they did have a kid, so I know they go back mm. at least to that point. Okay. But I don't know how much farther they could have been, um, mm -hmm. considering they seem like they were the same around the same age. She was from South Dakota. So, um, yeah, okay. I mean, they could have been. Okay, so Joanne had been with William for a while and had one of his children. Right. Okay. So I guess you go back to 1984, yeah, then maybe they were. Maybe that's uh, – because I guess where I'm going with this is that if they started dating after Gayla disappeared, uh, does it make sense then that a guy would tell his new girlfriend about uh, about somebody that uh, – a woman that he murdered? Maybe it's possible. It could have been, but they had a, they were drunks. They, uh, well, mm -hmm. he said drunks. Mm -hmm. uh, if you lived with Hagedorn, he'd probably drink a lot too. So I can't really judge ah. Joanne based on that. But, okay. Um, but like uh, they had a lot of drunken arguments. They, it was a violent type of a relationship. So even if they weren't together at the time, I can see him just mouthing off, saying, "You know, if you do something, we'll do something similar to what happened to Gayla, mm -hmm. or something like that," to her as a threat. And she may have told. I mean, she obviously she told her family members about it, and they knew about it, so they probably lived in fear. Do we have any uh, insight? Uh, once again, we're just uh, – and the listeners should know, when I have bloggers like Anthony on the program, we uh, tend to uh, theorize a little bit more. Like when Heather Grotman is on, we also – when she is on, we also do a little more theorizing than I think the listeners are used to in interviews. But um, – it does seem odd to me that if she was mentioning to her family, you know, William told me about this woman that something happened to her, and they, everybody had to know it was Gala, that none of these family members ever went to the police at that time and, and said what, what was going on here, I guess. I think, I think they were scared of the Hagedorns. I know that the, afterwards, after William was arrested, um, the Joanne family should, did, did receive threats regarding – Mm. Um, you know, regarding them saying anything about it, so um, and that was probably from Larry. So they they're probably scared. Their daughter was already dead. They didn't want anybody else to die either. So it's kind of understandable. Okay. Now another part of this uh, is that uh, given we can't forget about these calls before Gayla disappeared, this letter that was received before she disappeared and these calls that allegedly happened afterwards. I guess that nobody's ever been able to connect any of that to the Hagedorns? No, no, not to my knowledge. Okay. All right. So uh, let's move on to this. Regarding Ken, we can't forget about him, and he was the sole suspect uh, for 14 years. Now he's one of a few suspects, I guess, in 2020. Any allegations? I mean, how quickly did he move on after Gala disappeared? Did he, uh, once again, just your understanding, did he get another girlfriend a little quickly? Any allegations that he might have been cheating on Gala or anything like that that really couldn't cause us to start believing that he really didn't drop off Gala that day? No, no. He's, I've looked into him as Personally, he's not had any criminal record. He's been remarried, and he's been re remarried over 30 years now. Mm -hmm. I don't know how soon it was after Gala, but he seems to be a real upstanding citizen. He doesn't seem to be anything shady going on. I just think that he's been a guy that's been tortured over time. I feel, and like I said, that's why I didn't reach out to him. I didn't want to make him a bit of this stuff. But I do have to ask you again, and I know we talked about this a little bit already, but I, I do have to, you know, once again, just my experience in talking to, to so many uh, families of missing people and these people who saw these loved ones for the last time, and, you know, those days are really emblazoned, uh, and those moments are emblazoned in their in their memories. 
Um, don't you find it at least a little strange that he was shown those those shoes and the clothes and you know couldn't definitively say that they are definitely galas? Because obviously, if those items are definitely galas and they're on Hagedorn's property, I mean that's kind of seals the deal, even if her remains have not been found. True, um, but I don't think there's anything suspicious about him. Not, I mean, I don't. You know, I've got two teenage daughters, so I don't really memorize what they wear. You know, mm. every day either. So I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure uh, he knew because, like I said, they were um, in the in the description of when she went missing. There were uh, descriptions of what she was wearing that day. But like I said, those had been in the ground for a long time. I don't know the conditions of what they were, and I don't know if he. You know, um, he seems like a real honest guy. I don't think he wanted to, I don't think he was completely sure. So uh, he probably had it in his head that if he said this was definitely what she was wearing and it really wasn't, would he be actually helping and convict somebody that wasn't guilty of Gayla's disappearance? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of things that go into that. And I don't know if he just wanted to not finger point anything until he was absolutely sure. Uh, all, all the articles that he, he's only done a couple of interviews since recently, semi-recently, and he, all he said was that he doesn't understand what could have happened in that short amount of time. It completely baffles him. Yeah. So, I don't know if he's actually even sold on the Hagedorns being involved or not. I don't know. He's never said on record. Okay. And that does bring me to uh, another question. Once again, if you don't know, but it's something we can just uh, throw around some ideas on right here uh, for this interview. Uh I think Ken, if he is innocent, he brings up a good point that does something that sounds like, like something that happened very quickly. Do you get the impression that Gala would have – they may be the Hagenorns if they are guilty, uh, kind of knew she was coming over there? Is it possible that maybe she had a schedule that she would go over on certain days of the week at certain times so they'd know that she was going to be there? Or uh, if we're to – if you suspect that the Hagenorns caused this – in your mind, uh, how do you see it happening? It's possible um, that they knew she was coming. Um, I doubt that they knew that Ken was going to drop her off. I don't know if he had a schedule of washing his car. I don't think most people do, but some people might. But it makes sense that she had a schedule for feeding her horses. So um, it may have been a, mm -hmm. a thing where she actually walked over there to feed them. Who knows? Oh, it could have been totally a uh, spur-of-the-moment thing. Like I said, she's by herself. She's a very attractive lady walking alone in a pasture that they own. Yeah. So, I um, know. Um, and they could have been friendly with her. Who knows? If she could have stopped by and started talking to him, and it could have happened then. But according to what Joanne's family says, it happened in a metal shack that they own. Yeah. So, and the police have since said that they believe that she was abducted and mm -hmm. murdered and that the motive was sexual in nature so those two guys are really sick yeah uh, i think they did do it and i think they're sick uh you know you bring up the police and their initial theories and uh, is it true that maybe their theory on the disappearance changed over the years that she wasn't abducted that she was abducted uh or am i imagining that no actually i got it wrong in my entry i, I say to the fact that they, at first, they said that, in my analysis, I said that they said that it was unlikely that she was abducted, but actually, they said it was likely she was abducted. So they they did think that she was abducted early on, I think, and then um, we kind of just narrowed it down from there. Um, but I don't know whether – it's kind of weird the way they say it because if she wouldn't be abducted if they thought Kim was a suspect. It just means that yeah. he murdered his wife. But, right. Well – uh, this, it's very strange. I don't know if it's the wording or how they reported it, but like I said, the reporting is real poor on the case. They don't even give you a time in which she disappeared. So. Okay. Uh, have you tried to do uh, any FOIAs regarding information regarding her disappearance uh, from Moscow? Uh, you know, it's 1979. I don't know what you're going to get, but have you tried that yet, or do you plan to? Yeah, I submitted a request, but like this, it was mm -hmm. COVID. Um, it's yeah. going to take like be anytime soon. I, I submitted you an idea, depending upon who you submitted to. I submitted that one, Hartley one, uh, last time I was on your show, and I still have not got any. Still oh, my gosh. So, yeah. So, oh, my gosh. Um, but I know that they have at least three to four ringed binders full of uh, information on Gail's case. They showed that in a newspaper article, which which was really 
uh, interesting. I wish I could read those, but um, like I said, I don't know how long it's going to take. They don't mm-hmm. have um, people that do our work are never in a priority with them. They don't really care. <laughs> Uh, your impression on uh, this disappearance? Let's say that the Hagedorn incident in 1993 uh, never happens, and, and we're still uh, 41 years later. All we have is Ken dropped Gail off at this horse pasture. She disappears. He claims he has no idea what happened. Do you think 41 years later, without the Hagedorn incident, that would be thinking that Ken was responsible. I mean, what would and once again your your experience covering many disappearance cases, writing about them, for, you know, and all your experience before that, would you be thinking that Ken did something to her? Would you be open to the idea that something else happened to her? If the Agadorn incident didn't happen in 1993, I'd be contacting Ken wanting to know information about the case. So yeah, he'd still be looked at as a suspect, and that's where mm-hmm. I would have went. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, in reading it, and I think this is the reason, because uh, I had said, hey, Anthony, you haven't been on the program in over a year. Let's get you on the program. And uh, I was looking through uh, what you've uh, written, you know, you've been working on. And I have to admit that the reason that this one caught my eye is because it, it kind of does take that turn in 1993 because we cover so many disappearances uh, where husbands are uh, suspects and they tell these flimsy stories this is kind of what that sounds like, and then all of a sudden in 1993 it goes in a totally opposite direction. Is that is that your impression yeah. too? The way you look at it from your experience? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot. You wonder how many cases are like that because there's a number of cases I can think of off the top of my head where uh, it looks like you know this is the husband or this is such and such they did it they were the last this year, and it turns out that it ends up being not the case. I mean, a gate side have been found, but it's pretty obvious what happened. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, if, if that incident didn't happen, yeah, um, he would still be looked at, and I would have probably kept contacts in by now, and he probably would have hated me. So, <laughs> you know, I know, you know, um, yeah, it's just one of those things. It happens, and but yeah, it's, I'm, it's unfortunate somebody else had to die for that to come out. But that's true. That's a very Anthony, and that cannot be forgotten in all of this. It's unfortunate. We want information to come out in these disappearances that leads to a solution, but uh, to get it through the murder of an innocent person is, is not the way you want to go about it, for sure. Awful. No, she seemed like she's really young. She was a mother of two. At least one of those kids were his. Mm-hmm. And it looks like after her murder, they went to live with her parents in South Dakota. So, um, yeah. you know, it's unfortunate. Right. Where... Uh, once again, you've been living with this disappearance for a while now. Uh, is this going to be one of those disappearances where the only way it's going to get solved is by luck? Somebody happens upon remains that actually do get tested uh, out in some field somewhere around Moscow or, or wherever? Or you know, how do you see this getting solved now 41 years later? apply some pressure on William to do that, or um, she's somewhere in that field. She's probably somewhere in that field. I know that they dug up a, a concrete um, floor that he had laid not long after she disappeared, and they dug that up, and nothing mm-hmm. was found in that. So, And him being in the construction and the owner of a backhoe, I bet she's somewhere in that field. So I bet, I don't know whether if they ever took the Dabber dogs out there or whatnot, I think if they did some more looking into that field, I know it's a big, big field. It seems to be a really flat land out in that area, so she yeah. could be anywhere, but I'm pretty sure she's probably somewhere out in there. So it might be, I mean, the key is William. So yeah, um, they should really apply some pressure to him in some way. And I'm sure he'll, he, I'm sure he knows what happened. Mm-hmm. He was involved, so. So he was, once again, he was around the same age at the time. This might have been a situation where he saw her out there and she's attractive. I'm going to go talk to her and or do more. He has bad intentions and something happens. Uh, and, and it very well could be that his father maybe didn't know anything about it. I'm inclined to think that he probably did, but it very well could be that the younger uh, Hagedorn did this all on his own. Possible. It could have been, but I think um, the way that Joanne's family put it, Larry 
the way it's worded anyway makes you think that Larry was the one that came up with it and William mm -hmm. just went along with it. Okay. But I'm not sure. Uh, do the Hagedorns still own that property uh, where this horse pasture, where these things were found, where everything was dug up, or has that been sold to somebody else? Uh, I'm sure it's not the same owners anymore because Larry has since passed away. Um, mm -hmm. His wife has since remarried, and she lives in Las Vegas, last I checked. There are still some Hagedorns in Moscow, but I don't know where um, at in the family tree they are in relation to him. So I'm not sure. I know that uh, Joanne's son still resides somewhere in South Dakota, at least as of a couple of years ago. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm hoping it's in somebody else's hands. Uh, it doesn't sound like any digging has been done on the property since 1993, but I'm hoping if there are new owners that uh, they are open to that their property being searched at some point. I hope, so. I hope so. Okay, so this is the disappearance of Gayla Shaper uh, from Moscow, Idaho on June 29th, 1979. Let's move on to this. Now that we've talked about uh, Gayla's disappearance, and I, I appreciate you uh, filling all the listeners in on uh, the details and all the work that you've done so far, and it that sounds like um, when you get those FOIAs back, and hopefully they'll uh, give you some more information. So there's a good chance maybe in 2021 that you could be updating your entry on Gala's case. Yeah, that'd be great. I wish I could. Hopefully I will. Okay, and once again, the listeners should know it's crimeblogger1983.blogspot.com. Let's move on to this. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about, uh, in, in general, blogging, true crime, uh, in the first place, uh, being that you've been doing this for four years, I, when it pops up, I try to give recommendations and tips to people who are thinking about getting into podcasting. What would you say to people out there, listeners, who are maybe thinking about starting their own true crime blog? What kind of tips uh, can you give to beginners? The biggest thing is to don't rely on other, like even mine, like entries that bloggers do. Do original research because um, people get things wrong, even me. And we've I've dealt with a situation here recently where uh, you know about this, where somebody completely plagiarized a bunch of my entries for a, a blog that actually is at, at edu.com site, um, edu site. So, um, but a lot of the times you can get things wrong in cases or read things wrong. I've done it before myself where I've interpreted something wrong. I've had to go back and change it, but other bloggers will see that and they copy your work or take your work for granted and, and, and say the same thing. And it mm -hmm. just gets repeated over time. And it's not until somebody actually goes into the newspaper reports or gets the file and they really see, oh, well, they looked at this mm -hmm. wrong or they read this wrong or they interpreted it wrong. And, and it's since polluted the internet with wrong facts. So just yeah. do original research. Make sure you go to the source. Don't rely yeah. on bloggers like me because we're all – we make mistakes. All this <laughs> it's, it's good for people who just want to learn about disappearances and everything, but if you're thinking about starting your own, you need to start from scratch. Exactly. You know, just don't piggyback off of uh, people who are doing the work already. And I know that, yes, you we've talked about somebody who uh, is ripping you off. And, of course, that's not the first time. I know you and I have talked about that before. And um, I know that there are people out there who rip off Unfound as well. And, and in fact, Anthony, that's why I uh, respect your work so much. That's why I respect Heather Grotman's work at the Lost and Found blog as well. You two are getting out there and doing original work. You're not ripping off anybody. You're not just – now, you may post articles uh, from the time, but – you let the people judge it for themselves, and you don't pretend that, that it's your own work. You actually go to newspapers.com, cut the thing out, and post it on your site so people can see it. And so people know that it's not your work. You're not taking credit for it. And that's why I respect you, know, you so much. And as you know, on Unfound, we do all original work uh, as well. Any other tips uh, you know, besides that, uh, doing original work? Anything else? things that maybe went through your mind uh, when you were starting your blog and writing about your first case, which, whichever that one was? Well, you got to find your own style. Mine's an aggressive style. But my style doesn't work with everybody. Believe me, I've had to learn a lot of things 
for being that aggressive. Um, I learned a lot of things about, you know, talking to suspects. So if you talk to suspects or you want to do it like that, just be very careful because uh, there's a lot of dangerous people out there. Um, so that's one thing. But at, most of the time, you, it, blogging and, and doing your own blog is basically an extension of your personality. Mm-hmm. So um, you got to find your own way of doing it. Uh, like Ed, Ed's an info guy. You're all about info and being impartial. Um, and a lot, most of the other podcasts are just um, it's the, how they deliver the information. It's all um, appearance and little sound effects and <laughs> stupid stuff like that. Um, it's about music and so on. It's just not there's no real depth to it of information like there is on found, which is why I like it so much. Well, but it's basically just find your own. Find your own style, um, and style that suits you. Just do your original work, and but you can still like you know rely on other people's work, but at least give them some credit when you use their information, which is something that is severely lacking in the in this you know area of true crime. Yeah, and uh, the listeners should know. Although I do Unfound exclusively, so I can devote uh, uh, all of my time to it. Uh, of course, I do other things, as, as you know, uh, disc golf, for example, but uh, I can devote all of my time to Unfound, but Anthony, you have a family, you have a job, so this is something that you make time for in your life, even though you have these other things uh, going on that you also have to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes I would like to be able to do for a living, but like that's not something I'm really... I don't know how to do it very well, but if you do do it, regardless of whether you do it for um, your, you know, what you do for a living or if you do it as a side thing, um, at first I wanted to do it all myself, but um, I'm not the kind of person that's uh, multi-talented, I guess. I don't know about website building and audio stuff, and so if, you, if you're like me and you're not good at all that stuff, I'm just, I'm good at writing and uh, interviewing people, harassing bad people, stuff like that. Um, I have a little team that I, I have that helps me. Like I've got a my website just got revamped not that long ago to a friend of mine named Felicity. She went through and did a really good job of uh, redesigning my website. So she controls that aspect. And then I've got um, other people that do some research for me on the side. So it's really helpful to have a team. I know you have a team too that helps you out. Absolutely. And you can delegate. Um, so. Don't try to take it all on yourself if you if you don't uh, have to. So I got um, Morgan and my partners Leslie and uh, Felicity and uh, Jennifer. So I've got a, quite a few people that I can rely on. So it's really helpful. So if you can do that, you should. Yeah. So. How many hours would you say that you devote uh, to your blog uh, per week? It can vary um, because. I can get burned out on it. Like right now, I'm on break recently because uh, I've just got so overwhelmed with it. I, I go full force a lot. So on any given week, on a normal week, I'm probably dedicating probably 40 plus hours to any kind of case work. Mm-hmm. Even when I'm on a break, I don't make, I don't completely move myself away from anything. Like families can always call me still, and I still take the calls. I'm not going to tell them no. So, but like I'm always. When I'm not with my other obligations, I'm constantly doing case work. So it's, mm-hmm. it's almost like a job, but something I enjoy. So yeah, but yeah 40 plus probably. Wow. 40 plus hours a week in addition to the job that you have and your fatherly duties. Yeah, I'm, right, I'm writing, uh, I do research on my breaks at work on my phone. So yeah, okay. I've even wrote a entries by the way. Okay. Well, I hope your employer doesn't hear that. Okay, that's that's uh okay. Uh that's that's funny. Okay. Um anything else, Anthony, before we complete this interview? And once again, uh Anthony's uh website is crimeblogger nineteen eighty three dot blogspot dot com. Anything else before we conclude this interview? No, I just want to thank you because like interviews with you are so easy. Like um <laughs> I'm always worried about the way somebody would, uh, when I do other interviews, how they take certain things or they edit certain things. And 
or even when I'm talking to somebody, and you are just so easy to do. It's, I really appreciate coming on, and I'll continue to come on as long as you'll have me. Well, I, I appreciate that, Anthony. You're always welcome back. Uh, I think, uh, you know, like I said, it's been over a year, and I didn't even realize that till recently. And I was like, well, I think it's time. Let's get him back on here. And, of course, the first time was uh, Tammy Leopards in August of uh, 2017, and then it was Evelyn Hartley uh, from Wisconsin. She disappeared in the 50s, and then Lucera Sarabia, and now Gayla Schaefer. So, Anthony, it's good talking to you again. Um, of course, we talk offline through Messenger all the time, but it's good to have you officially back on the program again. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one more thing. Um, Please. It is real. It is real. So, um, all the other podcasters, like, um, there's a little click they got going on where they, Ed doesn't get the credit he deserves to get. So, um, I appreciate that. if you want Thank actual you. depth and information, Ed's podcast is where it's at. All those rest are just, there's a few out there that are good, but, um, I don't care. Most of them don't like me anyway, so that's fine. But, uh, Ed's the real deal. So, um, I really appreciate that. And, and, he doesn't get the credit he deserves and he should. So. I appreciate that, Anthony. Thank you very much. You're very kind. And thank you for being on this episode of Unfound. Hey, thank you. You're welcome. And that was my interview with Anthony from crimeblogger1983.blogspot.com. I thank him for joining me and all of you for the fourth time. An Unfound Record. If you're wondering why he's been on the program that many times, and if you're also wondering why Heather Grotman from the Lost and Found blog has been on twice, in fact, I'll probably invite her to be on the program again in early 2021. If you're wondering why these two make the cut, it's very simple. Like what we do here, these two do their own work. They do not plagiarize, they do not rip off others, they bring original information to the public. They understand that they are in a unique position that requires discretion and integrity. They go about their business the only way it can be properly done, which is the right way. People like that will always be welcome on Unfound. As for my insights on the interview I did with Anthony, it's certainly hard not to see some kind of connection between the Hagedorns and Gala's disappearance. As I stated in one of the questions I asked you to consider before the interview started, what are the odds that a person connected to the horse pasture would murder a woman 14 years later? I'm guessing the probability isn't Powerball odds, but it's certainly up there. I also don't find it hard to believe that if Gala never had any problems with the Hagedorns in the past, she might not have felt weird if one of them asked her to go to their house for a drink or something. Or maybe Gala had to go to the bathroom and knocked on their door. Certainly conceivable. And I think Anthony brought up a very good point. If Gala had problems with the Hagedorns, would she not have moved her horses to someone else's field? I think so. So, if we're going to suspect the Hagedorns, this must have come out of nowhere for Gala. Yet all murderers were non-murderers until they committed their first one. And with some of the recent disappearances we've covered, we have raised the possibility that law-abiding adult men can become violent in a matter of seconds. But what are we to make of a woman standing out in a field next to a highway? And nobody saw her. That not only did no one see her, but no one saw the Hagedorns either. And Gala's disappearance was big news the day after it happened. So the public had to know about it. Still, no one came forward. Was it perfect timing on the Hagedorn's part? Or was it something else? I'm also confused how Ken didn't recognize the shirt and shoes found. I've done enough interviews now to know. 
mothers and brothers and sisters remember exactly what their loved one was wearing when he or she disappeared. So why didn't Ken? And let's not forget, the calls and message were never connected to anyone, let alone the Hagedorns. So although the murder in 1993 certainly could point us in a direction of a new scenario that doesn't involve Ken, maybe it just seems so. I'll leave the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.